everybody, it's Romania Black, and um, yeah, these light novels are no joke. <laughs> they are a lot, but I've been really enjoying them. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so can we talk about the third light novel? Because the first light novel is really good. I like the first light novel a lot. The second light novel, there was a lot to talk about, but it was very, it didn't feel complete, right? It felt like because those two chapters were not translated, um, we can only talk about so much. But um, this one, what? I, mm, I, this one is maybe one of my favorites so far. And there's several chapters that are really good. Um, there's several chapters that are really like what I wouldn't have expected Kuroko's Basketball to talk about, but yet they are. And and now I realize what people were talking about as these light novels have been adapted into manga. The light novel, the replace manga, which I talked about in the live stream today. We did a live stream and I was like, I'm about manga out. I love Kroko's Basketball's manga. I love it. I'm eating it up. But I think after it's done, I'm going to be like, okay, Romania needs a little break from manga reading for a little bit because it's just, it's so good and there's so many details, but I am glad that I'm not looking at the replace manga that I have the light novels because it has been refreshing to actually read a book. <laughs> I feel like other than Heaven Official's Blessing, I've not read a lot outside of this channel, so it's good to read a book because this has been a really, really fun experience with the light novels. So yeah, let's just dive in. I have like nine pages of notes to talk with you all about, so I don't know how long this is gonna be, but this is probably the most notes I've made for a light novel so far because there's just a lot to get through. So there were five chapters, uh, technically six. There's a bonus chapter that's not very long. Um, one of the chapters did not have a translation, but um, chapter four, the replaced manga, actually chapters 34 and 35 of the replaced manga actually deal with what's happening. So I'll talk about it and show you guys a panel from it, but I had, to, I had to read the manga chapters on a very sketchy site and it said there were viruses in the images. I was like, it's fine. We don't have to do that. <laughs> so um, I do want to give a special shout out to Truck over on Patreon for finding and putting together these documents with the light novels in them. Um, the translation credits go to Anime Manga uh, Daisuke and um, for getting the translations for these together. So thank you both so much. And then chapter four we'll talk about with the manga replace uh, the actual manga panels for it. So yeah, um, chapter one is called The Summer Festival of the Generation of Miracles. Again, in keeping with the replaced light novel tradition, we start out with a Taiko chapter. And honestly, this Taiko chapter is freaking good. It is so long though. It's like 70 pages nearly for this chapter. And I was like, wow, there's a lot of story with this. And so um, there's actually, this light novel is probably the longest that I've read so far. It's like with the manga pages, like 130 or so pages. Um, I, there's gonna be a lot condensed. So I do highly encourage you to go out. There is a link in the discord to the manga chapters. And if you go, actually, if you go to internet archive, if you do internet archive, Kuroko's Basketball Replace, these novels are up on there. The translations are up on there. So if you just do an internet archive for replace light novels, you can find copies that have been translated that are basically what I'm reading here. And you can kind of check them out for yourself, which is fun. But um, Taiko's having a summer festival. Everyone's wearing yukatas, which is super fun. Um, Almine is complaining. Uh, again, in keeping with the grand tradition of these light novels, Almine is complaining about how Momoi is addressing him. They have such like a married couple, sundere relationship throughout this. But now he's complaining that she's calling him Dai Chan in public. And apparently ever since starting middle school, she's started calling him Almine Kun in public, but Dai Chan when they're together. And she thought it would be weird to call him Almine Kun when it was just the two of them. So it still aggravates him. He has this, he's just a big cindere. Almine's just a big cindere. He's like, well, I don't know why you call me this, blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that Momoi's grandmother gave Momoi one of her own yukatas to wear and then gave one of Momoi's grandfathers. Uh, it's not specified, but the grandmother's worried that it would fit for him. So I'm pretty sure it was her grandfather's um, yukata for Almine to wear. So basically Almine is wearing the yukata of Momoi's grandfather. Fine. No, no shipping there. Nothing to worry about. <laughs> and Almine, he's just like, oh, well, it's okay. I mean, it looks fine. It's like dark navy blue. Perfect for him. I'm like, of course. He's all cindere about it. 
And Momoi lets on, though, that Almine looks good at it. And then she turns it into a joke, which irritates Amine. It's like the two of them can't flirt with each other. So they just make up these big jokes. But it's like, it's one of those scenarios, like when the couple flirts, it's like they're, when they're aggravating each other and annoying each other, it's their flirting. Like they're, they're bickering back and forth is their flirting. So I'm like, come on now. <laughs> but Almine, interestingly enough, he acts very antisocial. Um, he likes to avoid big crowds. And when they go to the shrine, for where the festival is being held at. He convinces, um, he basically goes with Momoi, but he doesn't really want to hang out with anybody. And Momoi convinces him to make a wish with her at the little shrine there. And so I'm going to direct quote some of the things from the book that I really liked. Um, it says, Momoi prayed earnestly. I hope Almine can go through the summer holiday smoothly. He can finish his homework and not get injured during practice. And I hope I can get closer to that person. Meaning Kuroko. It's like, it's like Amine and Momoi know that they both love each other, but they're trying to convince each other that they, that they don't. And it's like, what do we do? Um, but Amine doesn't want to interact with anybody. So he goes to the, basically what is set up as the visitor's lounge. And he tells Momoi, he's like, just go get me some food or something. And she's like, okay. And she feels left out. She's like, why doesn't Amine want to come walk around with me? But again, Amine is kind of in a slump. And that's when she sees Kuroko. And Kuroko has a black yukata on, which I thought that was really cool. It ties with his name. And he has a black yukata on. And, of course, Momoi fangirls about it. And Kuroko, the first thing Kuroko asks, though, is he's like, hey, where's Amine? <laughs> which is great. And Momoi unloads the tea upon him and tells him everything. And Kuroko's like, well, that sounds about right. <laughs> about Amine not wanting to walk around with her. So Momoi gets Kuroko to hang out with her, which is really funny. And really cute. And then some guy named Kondo apparently ditched Kuroko. Somebody on Taiko's team named Kondo. They ditched him. And Kuroko the whole time is worried that Almine is going to be mad that they don't immediately go get him food and bring it back. But Moy's like, no, no, no. Almine will be fine. He's a big boy. Let's go walk around for a bit and then we'll get him some food and bring it back. And apparently Momoi is like, I have to keep eyes on Kuroko because Kuroko is apparently flighty. And she thinks he's likely to disappear or she'll forget where he is. So they go basically walking around the festival. Kuroko wants to play the balloon fishing game because it's one of his favorites. And she eyes this pink balloon and Kuroko is determined to get it for her, which makes Momoi fangirl. She's like, he's going to win me a prize. Oh my gosh. But another guy wants to get it and he doesn't realize that Kuroko is right there. He doesn't see Kuroko and then these two guys that show up that don't realize Kuroko is there, one has glasses and one is described as having wrist bracelets on and they're both in high school. They're not named and I kept wondering if they would be like actual guys that are in the series that were like second years when Kuroko's first year, but we don't get to find out for sure or not. But they basically start to hit on Momoi because they don't realize that Kuroko's there and Kroka finally like makes himself known and asks Momoi to leave with him because she seems really uncomfortable, right? And Kroka's sad that he wasn't noticed, which is really which is really kind of heartbreaking in the book that Kroka's like, man, I wish that I had been noticed and maybe I could have gotten your balloon for you. And he like pats Momoi's shoulder and everything. And you kind of feel bad for him because you're like, damn, Kroka wasn't noticed. That sucks so much. But then they run into Murisaki Bara. I like Murisaki Bara has like a cut sleeve Yakuda. It's not like because he's so big that and as my dogs are growling over a bone he's with Akashi surprising no one so it's interesting I guess this is before Homuro showed up so before Homuro came into the picture Murasaki Bara hung out with Akashi imagine that and I like that Akashi's Yakuda has flying dragons on it which is very like regal and kind of like very posh very elitist but it's like fits his character it's a white Yukata with like dragons all over it, which I personally would be all about. So I'm I'm here for the fashion choice. I like it. And Akashi is entering a shogi contest, and we find out the only reason Murisaki Bara is with him is that the prize is this giant snack box. And Akashi says he'll give it to Murisaki Bara if he wins. So makes sense what's happening, right? So we kind of run the mill of seeing all the generation of miracles. We run into Medorma. I really like Medorma has this black yukata on. When we see the picture of it later, it looks like it has dragonflies, which is kind of cool. But it makes him look apparently more mature. And he's all alone, which really makes me sad because it kind of hints at the fact that unless he's hanging out with Akashi, 
before he met Dakau, he really was kind of a loner. And I'm watching the dub of Kuroko's Basketball right now, catching up on it, and there I'm at the episode with Shutoku versus Seirene, and where Takao's talking about how Madorma was a loner, and I'm like, yeah, it really makes me realize just how great Takao and Madorma are together, and so seeing him, like, be all by himself playing the hoop toss game is, it's kind of sad, but Madorma says that he's playing the games in order to try to win lucky items, and Murasaki Bara, very similar to the festival audio drama, steps in to help play the hoop game too and help Madorma. And he's really good at it. So Madorma's like, oh, hey, instead of when he's mad in the audio drama that we've listened to a while back, Madorma's like, hey, he decides to use Murasaki Bara to win him prizes. And Murasaki Bara kind of goes along with it for a while. And Kuroko makes Madorma promise that he'll get Mura snacks in exchange. And Madorma like, disgruntly agrees finally he's like fine I'll do it and that problem kind of gets settled um Kuroko tries to win Momoi a prize but unfortunately by the time Kuroko gets to playing the game the manager is mad because Murasaki Bara keeps winning and he won't let Murasaki Bara play anymore and sadly Kuroko's not as good at games as Murasaki Bara and Midoromo was and the manager feels bad for Kuroko so he gives him this consolation prize and it says in the text Momoe looked at the teddy bear she chose carefully. It was definitely not a normal stuffed bear. It had lazy, soulless eyes like Frankenstein's monster. Its head had a Jason mask hanging off of it, and it was carrying a sickle and an electric saw on its back. Kuroko didn't understand why she liked it, but we, the audience, figure out that its eyes remind her of Kuroko. So that's why she picks it, and I'm like, oh my god. So she's walking around with this terrifying looking teddy bear. Um, Kuroko wonders if they should get Amine something to eat. And Momoi says that he could, they could go get food together. And she and then so these guys show up and they try to hit on Momoi again. And Kuroko steps in to defend her again. And just then, while Kuroko's getting up in this guy's face, Kisei shows up. And Kisei kind of diffuses the situation because he's followed by a bunch of fangirls. And the guy kind of gets like freaked out. There's all these people around. So he leaves. And Kisei is surprised that Kuroko shows off this kind of aggressive defensive side to him. And Kiki Kuroko was like, no, I just didn't like how they were treating Momoi. And it's kind of cool to see it happen. Um, Kisei's wearing this light blue yukata with penguins on it. And he notes to uh, Momoi and Kuroko that it takes a lot of courage to wear a light colored yukata. And they all know that they kind of note that Akashi is wearing a white yukata. So that must mean he has a lot of courage to, uh, to wear it. So Kisei asks about Amine and notes that he's hesitant to join them because he doesn't want to be a light bulb or basically a third wheel, which I love that it's phrased as a light bulb. He's like, I kind of want to be a light bulb in this situation. And I'm like, oh, like a third wheel? And Momoi gets kind of embarrassed by that. She's like, oh, no, 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 no. And they come to the conclusion that no one has hit on Momoi at festivals in the past because she's always been with Amine. And it's always looked like they were a couple and people were intimidated by him. And so Momoi, she kind of gets huffy about that. And she's like, well, Almine says in the past he's been distracted by women with big boobs and he's not there with me on a date. And she just gets all huffy about it. And Kisei's like, well, that's kind of normal for a guy to notice a lady with boobs. And Momoi gets even madder at that. She's like, well, then she shouldn't do that when he's on, when he's hanging out with me because, you know, Momoi's pretty well endowed. Why should Almine look anywhere else, you know? It's kind of like she doesn't want to admit that they could be a couple, but she's in denial. She's in blatant, flagrant denial the entire time. Uh, Kroko, who wasn't really paying attention to this conversation that Momoi and Kisei are having, um, doesn't really say anything. And Momoi takes that for him being gentlemanly, but Kisei takes it as Kroko being sly when really Kroko has no interest in girls or this conversation. <laughs> it's great. And so they meet back up with Medorama and someone trips in this scene and tries... So like they, they trip over and they get Momoi soaked with water and they try to take her bear from her. And Kuroko prevents her Yukata from getting wet by like stepping in and taking most of the, the throne drink himself. And so Momoi feels bad. At this point, she tells uh, Kisei and Midorama and Kuroko that she feels bad. These guys are all flirting with her and she's drug all three of them in to like try to protect her. And I like that Midorama steps in. He's like, um, those men should feel bad because they're wasting their time. And you've not bothered us one bit. Like, I like it. Madorma actually steps up and tells Momoi that she's not, like, bothering anybody. And it's a really sweet, like, moment with them all as friends. And so they hear some commotion over at the rest area that Almine had been at. 
And so they go back to check on Almine and there's all these monks surrounding him. They're like interested in Almine's physique and his body and they immediately think him and Moy are a couple which just makes things instantly awkward and Almine instantly denies it. And so it turns out the men, what they're actually wanting is for Almine to help carry this like box to a shrine for them because he's so physically fit. And then Almine like tries to rope Kise and Medorma into all of this and Murasaki Bara and Murasaki Bara is like he's bribed with snacks to help them and Almine is just getting more and more irritated and it just kind of comes to a head when he finds out that throughout all of this, Momoi meeting up with all the Generation of Miracles, she didn't bring him back any food. <laughs> And so the guys kind of defend Momoi and say, like, it's Amine's own fault. He should have gone and got his own food. He shouldn't have been depending on Momoi. And that's when she realizes that Kuroko, apparently at some point when the guy spilt water on, on Kuroko and Momoi, there was, like, a Daruma doll that had been won from Momoi. And Kuroko goes back to try to find it. This part was a little bit confusing to read. I had to, like, go back a few times and read over it, and it was still kind of weird. So she leaves the boys to handle the situation with the monks and the whole carrying the shrine thing. And she takes off to go find Kroko and see where he got off to. And of course, along the way, she's flirted on by these creepy guys. And Kuroko shows up to help her escape for them. But for some reason, they all want the bear that she has. Like the toy bear, the creepy bear that she found, they all want it. And they all try to confront her and Kuroko to get it. And that's when Kisei and Murasaki Bara show up. And them and Kuroko manage to scare the guys off and take the stuffed bear to lure the others away. And then meanwhile, Medorba is about to be forced to carry the shrine alongside Almine because the others aren't back yet. When luckily, Murasaki Bara, Kisei have lured all of these like guys flirting with Momoi back to the shrine. And they're roped into helping carry the shrine box instead. It's a big old mess of chaos. It's insane. It felt like Skate the Infinity when they go to the shrine, like in that series, I think the, the beach episode six, it felt a lot like that. But it turns out that the guys that have been flirting with Momoi all day long are all connected. They're all part of some gang called Black Lizard. I'm like, what is this Bungo Stray Dogs? And they've been flirting with her all day to try to get the bear from her. And so while they're carrying the cart, the police get called and we find out later they're a gang of robbers. And the toy bear that Momoi received was a bear that they hid gemstones in to try to smuggle away. And I was like, oh my God. So yeah, so basically, Kroko and them got a gang of robbers arrested that were trying to steal a bear from Momoi because it had gemstones in it. At Takeo Middle School's summer festival. What? What is happening here? So they all get together to watch fireworks at the end of the day after all this is settled. And Momoi thinks that she should leave to go home. She thinks she shouldn't stay out late. She's like, oh, my parents are going to worry about me. I shouldn't stay out as late as you guys. I got to go. And what's interesting is that Akashi at this point, who is hanging out with them, suggests that Almine tell Momoi to call her family and get their approval to let her stay and watch the fireworks. Which he does. But, I mean, it's Almine using... Kisei's phone to get Momoi to call them and Akashi's the one that suggested Almine do it. So it's like they all kind of have this suggestion that, you know, if anybody's going to get Momoi to do anything, it's going to be Almine. I can't imagine why. And meanwhile, I, Momoi, instead of thinking about Almine orchestrating all of this, all she can think about is that Kuroko tells her that staying at the fireworks would be worth it. And that's what gets her to call. So it's, a, it's this big old this big old love triangle where Momoi is like trying to get with Kuroko and she doesn't realize what Almine is doing for her and Almine doesn't want her to like hit on him because he thinks it's awkward and it's just it's just yeah. OT3 just make it an OT3 and then we've solved all the problems <laughs> right right so yeah so that was chapter one of this novel it was a big old chapter like I said it was a huge chapter there was so much chaos, so much going on. You could have made an OVA out of it, but I'm going to be honest with y'all. The second chapter of this light novel, I really liked the Medorma and Takao chapter from previous light novels. No, this light novel chapter, chapter two of volume three, it's my favorite so far. It is, it is everything that I could have wanted with Hyuga and Rico. I, y'all, y'all. 
It's called a gift to the coach. It's pronounced, the translation said couch, and at first said a gift to the couch, and I was like, what? But it's supposed to be coach. And so it takes place right after Hyuga agrees to form the base basketball club with Tepe, and Rigo convinces, Rico convinces them they need to go on a shopping trip to get supplies for the club room. She's like, okay, we're making a basketball club. We need to have supplies. We need to go shopping. So they're in the hallway of the school when they make this decision. And what's interesting is right off the bat, um, Hyuga catches Rico staring at his hair, which he's just dyed back to black. And he asks if she thinks it, it, that it looks bad. And she doesn't. She's excited to have the basketball team started and she starts to prance back to class. But she realizes that others are, may think that she's prancing because she's excited to have been walking with Hyuga or dating him. And she stops and literally says she doesn't want the rumors to spread. But despite calming herself down, she's really happy that Hyuga decided to join the team. I'm like, come on now. I, at that point, I was like, so she doesn't want people to think they're dating. But usually if you don't want them to think that, but you're still like happy about it, it's like, you, come on now. So she thinks that Hyuga is taking the team seriously and dyeing his hair back to black means he's serious about the team and the quote unquote, the basketball he loves, which is so cute. And then of course, she has the sadistic side to her, right? Like I'm gonna quote exactly from the book. It says, even though he was starting to take basketball seriously, it was still a bit too late, Rico thought. After making me worry for so long, you should repay me by taking extra practice. After all, for an athlete, a rusty body and skills is the ultimate life wound that could impact them. Rico added another segment to her training regimen in her mind. Hugh Cocoon's special training regimen. Of course I won't let him die. And hurried back to her own classroom. I'm like, Rico, you, you sadistic mother trucker. Come on now. So then, Hugh and Rico go by themselves to go supply shopping. They don't bring Tepe, they go by themselves. And as they're finished getting supplies, um, Hugo suggests that they go get drinks afterwards. And I'm like, wait, you're suggesting they go get drinks? What? Go get a shake together? What? And Rico's asking why, and he says he wants to give her a thank you gift. And he says, quote, well, it's because I've caused you a lot of trouble um, involving basketball in the past, and in the future I might cause you trouble again. So Rico replies that she became coach for the team because she thought it would be interesting and that she hasn't forgotten their rooftop promise to be the best in Japan. She says, instead of drinks, let's just go back and practice. And as they turn to go, not to get drinks, because why would we do that? Um, she notices something in a shop window. Now they don't tell us what it is at the time. They don't tell us what's in the shop window that she notices, but Hugo does note that it's really expensive. And Rico kind of gets discourages gets discouraged and she agrees. She's like, ah, yeah, let's not get it. And Hyuga asks why she won't get it. And she says that the budget won't cover it. And she shifts focus back to their practice tomorrow. Of course, Hyuga goes back to the window after Rico leaves, making you think that he's going to get the gift for her. So back at school, Izuki notices that Hyuga seems really troubled and he asks him why he's so concerned. And he said he's sad because he wanted to get Rico the gift she saw in the window, but he doesn't have any extra money. He spent it all on some kind of crane game after school like a high schooler would, and he doesn't have the funds to get it. So Izuki comes up with this idea that the team could just get it together, saying, oh, it's something that the team could benefit from and we could just give it to her as a gift as the new coach. And Hyuga seems a little bit reluctant at first, but then he decides to agree. So Kagane gets involved. He instantly decides to help. Um, his text has lots of emojis, which is funny. And he texts Matobe, and Matobe is in too. At, which means that Kogane and Matobe were together. Because Kogane texts, he's like, oh, let me ask Matobe. And then he instantly texts back that they were back together, right? Um, Hyuga and Izuki note that they've never heard Matobe speak. And Izuki says it's his goal to make Matobe laugh at one of his puns which is really cute. And the only other person to reply back was Tepe, and he shows up in person instead of texting, which I thought was kind of like such an old man thing to do. We've noted that Tepe lives with his grandparents, and his grandparents probably don't text. They probably just show up and talk to them. So it was a very old man thing to do. He claims that his hands are so big that texting is a problem. And Hugo gets really flustered at him. <laughs> because we know at this point, I know from, from somebody has commented that Tepe and Rico used to date at one time. And I'm like, Hugo, are you envious because Tepe has such big hands that he can't text? Because you know what they say about guys with big hands? They've got a really good vice grip on a basketball. <laughs> so yeah, 
So Tepe suggests that they gift the gift today and give it to her today because it's the first day of practice. And Hyuga is a little bit concerned. Him and Izuki are like, well, it's the first day of practice. We don't want to be late. Rico will be really mad. And Tepe's like, oh, no, no, we'll just go get it. We'll get back in time. It'll be fine. So the five of them go to get Rico this gift. And while it is awkward at first, because Hyuga and the others don't really know how to handle Matobe, I love that in the novel, Hyuga instantly appreciates Matobe, saying that Tepe and Kagane won't shut up. They're talking nonstop. And Hyuga instantly appreciates the silence that Matobe brings. <laughs> now, the gift that they get for Rico is 10,000 yen which in American dollars is like $70 USD. And when you find out what this gift is, you're like, wait, they paid 70 bucks for that? But they did. They each chip in 2,000 yen to get the gift, to gift wrapped it, gift wrapped it, etc. And then on the way back, they managed to run into Suchita. And Tepe says that he knows him from being in the same class as him and he's a really nice guy. And Suchita says he was kind of like in awe of their rooftop confession which surprises Hyuga because apparently after they've confessed on the rooftop, everybody's made fun of them at the school. And so he's felt kind of bad about it. And so hearing this, that Suchita actually thought it was cool, he asks Suchita to join the basketball team. And Suchita, who hadn't been on the basketball team at this point, which I didn't realize, he's like, oh, I don't know if I could, I don't have any basketball experience. And Kagane's like, I don't either. You can still join. And so... They try to convince him by saying they have a female club manager, or they don't, but they have a coach instead. And then as they're trying to convince Suchita, using Rico as the example, Hyuga admits and he thinks to himself, he's like, well, Rico does have some female charm. But Suchita ends up deciding to join them, thinking it could be fun. And right as they're celebrating Suchita joining the basketball team, this big gust of wind comes through and knocks the present out of Kogane's hand and it falls over an overpass <coughs> onto a moving truck. What's crazy about this is that Hyuga in the novel actually decides that he's going to jump up and like jump onto the truck off the overpass. And Izuki's like, whoa, you could break every bone in your body. But Hyuga was willing to jump off an overpass onto the truck to get Rico's gift for her. Okay. And so Tepe suggests reasonably that they call the police instead tell the license plate number and go find the gift that way and so Hyuga is extremely flustered saying there's no time and they're not going to get back in time to meet Rico with the gift when practice starts which is what happens they finally show up at the gym we find out that Rico has been pacing back and forth she'd clean the gym up she'd make it sparkly clean and they show up covered in sweat and mud and she is furious and tells them to hurry up and go get changed. And they like, they go change without questioning anything. And so Rico, when they come back, she's really upset and they're, they all feel bad. And she's like, I'm afraid you guys aren't serious about this. And she feels betrayed that they showed up so late. And they all start apologizing at once. She finally demands to know what happened. And Hyuga steps forward with the box with the gift in his hand looking like a damn engagement ring shows up with the box and bows and gives it to her but he's so shy and he's so flustered he can't tell what's in the box he can't find the words to tell her and I'm like are you freaking serious and Tepe has to say that it's a gift to her from the team and I was like ah oh, I felt so bad in that moment because I'm like Hugo this was your chance he gives her the box and she opens it up and it's her signature pink whistle that they all gave her, that they tried to put back in the box the best that they could. Like, granted, that whistle was $70, which seems outrageous to me, but luckily, Hyuga does gain his confidence back and he tells her everything that happens. She yells at them for being reckless and nearly getting injured chasing after a truck to get her a gift. And Hyuga and the others then suddenly realize that as she's yelling at them, she's doing so as a coach would. And in that moment, Hugo's like, all right, coach, we got it. And he's the first one to call her coach. And she proudly takes the title to heart and they start practice. It is such a good chapter. I was like, my Hugo Rico shipper heart was bursting 
I was in love. I was so mad that Hugo couldn't talk to her because he was so like freaked out in the moment. And then Tepe is the one that has to step in, of course, Tepe, and be like, Hugo has something to tell you. And I'm like, uh, basically, if Hugo ever proposes to Rico, Tepe is going to have to be on hand to translate what Hugo is trying to say. But it's such a good chapter. It's so sweet. It's so sentimental. And I'm just like, if I couldn't ship Hugo and Rika more, I there's no chance. Like I, I, they're OTP. Could not ship them more. Throw Tepe in as an OT three so they can be together and just like, oh, that chapter's so good. I love the first two chapters of this so so much. Um, chapter three is about Kagami's childhood story. It takes place in Los Angeles. This chapter is long. It is freaking long. And it's a little tedious. I I liked it. It was a good chapter, but it is a really long chapter and it kind of like goes around in circles for a little bit. But it takes place in Los Angeles. Kagami has lived there for a year at this point. And the chapter starts with him playing three on three on this street basketball court with some of the Americans. Um, Kagami laments that his hands aren't as large as his peers. I'm like, why? And Himuro is there and tells him not to worry about it. So the two start talking about like these parks and schools. There's apparently like an R school and a G park. I guess they didn't want to say them because American names or whatever. But they talk about going to school in the future together and not being sure if that's going to quite happen. And it's so kind of bittersweet because you know that Kagami isn't going to go to school with Hamuro. And when they talk about it, it, it just has this like very bittersweet feeling like you want him to be able to go to, but you know how things turn out, right? So we find out that our school is an abandoned building where a lot of kids in the area test their courage. Again, we've had a light novel that involved a test of courage earlier. This is Kagami's childhood test of courage with Hamuro. And apparently a lot of kids have gone there playing basketball and left their basketballs there being freaked out. And Hamuro thinks that there's like two crates worth of basketballs that have accumulated there. So this chapter is kind of insane because Kagami and Hamuro decide to go get the basketballs, but the school is 20 miles away, like 32 kilometers. And they decide that, well, it'd take too long to walk. So they're like 10 or 11 at this point. They're going to ride their bikes and go get it, which is still really far, right? So then, like, like you do, they decide to lie to their parents and spend their Saturday and Sunday going back and forth to get the basketballs from the school. They decide to set out. Hermero has this map memorized, which Kagami is glad that he has a map because apparently his family didn't have one. And Hamuro gets on to Kagami about his grades, that he's not thinking things through. But in the conversation he has with Kagami, he shows that he does care about him. Hamuro is like a big brother, true and true. He is a big brother for sure. But they realize that unlike Japan, uh, in America, you can't just leave and go places by yourself. People are afraid that you might get kidnapped. And they spend a lot of portion of the chapter talking about how Japan and America are different and kind of the different standards that they have for how kids can just go off on their own in Japan, where in America that's not common practice. And so Kagami, Kagami does give the hint that his family is pretty wealthy because they've hired a nanny to watch over Kagami. So I'm like, if your family can hire a nanny, you got some money, right? So they wonder what they're going to do and they decide they're going to lie to their parents and basically say, oh, I'm spending the night at your house. I'm spending the weekend with you. You're spending the weekend with me. And then they'll never know that we're both going off on our own little adventure. Don't ever do that. <laughs> That's a bad idea. I'm like little kids reading this book. Don't do this at home, right? So they wander off and they notice that the police in the area are watching them because they seem like they're not like part of this urbanized um, suburban neighborhood. They don't look familiar. And so the police, they figure out that they think the police are worried that they're going to trespass and vandalize the school. And that's why they're just kind of lurking around. Um, Hermuro though, despite being concerned with Kagami, manages to throw off the police and gets them to get away from them without being followed. It's kind of curious to see Hermuro be kind of the bad boy in this situation where he's like, like Kagami is amazed at Hermuro and his like moment, like his quick thinking in the moment. 
And Himuro is kind of embarrassed by how amazed Kagami is by him. I feel like it's a sign of why Himuro gets so well, gets on so well with Murasaki Bara because he gets really embarrassed when Kagami praises him and he's like, uh, no. He's like at the opposite of a praise kink. Kimura's like, I don't want you to praise me. No. So it makes sense why he gets along so well with Murasaki Bara because Mura never does that. So it's fun. It's interesting. But unfortunately, in throwing off the police, the two ended up going west instead, or they ended up going north instead of west. And so they debate trying to backtrack and they end up staying overnight, two 10 year olds staying overnight in the National Forest Park. And I, they know how big American forests are. It's like the countryside. And then in the process of getting to the park, the tires on their bikes get punctured. And Kagami suggests that they leave the bikes until they can go get tools to fix them later. I mean, 10 year old logic makes sense. They decide to stop in the forest for the night and Kagami, who had packed some rice balls, gives some of him to, to Kimuro. And as they're eating, this gold retriever shows up. And Himuro notes that the golden retriever kind of looks like Alex, who they've met at this point in the story. And of course, Kagami is absolutely terrified of the golden retriever. So the dog has a tag on it that even says Alex. And that's what reminds them even more of their mentor. So Himuro manages to calm Kagami down and realize the dog is not going to hurt them. And they carry on into the park to find like a stopping point before they stop for the night. And the next day they're going to pick up and go to the R school where the basketballs are. So along the way, Himuro like falls into like, he like trips over something and falls and he gets hurt, but he's fine, but it makes them stop for the night. And the two end up like pitching this little like makeshift tent and staying there and they sleep next to each other alongside Alex the dog. It's a really cute scene, but I'm like, children, do not try this at home. This is terrifying. These two kids like went off into this national park all by themselves and we're okay. So they end up waking up the next day and realize that the park area that they're next to is by this big giant dog park. And so they pretend to walk Alex to like get through without being noticed. And Kagami the whole time is freaking out because there's dogs everywhere. So it's like his worst nightmare. <laughs> so as they travel through, it starts raining. They finally make it to the R school, but they're like soaked, drenching wet. Kagami has been scared by dogs. Himuro was injured on the hiking trail. It's just a big old fiasco. And so they make their way through the school as it's storming outside and they get freaked out thinking that there are ghosts throughout this school, right? It's very similar to the um, the ghost hunting in the audio drama or in the light novel that we listened to first, right? And so um, Himuro ends up getting his leg caught again through some boards. So he like gets injured again. And as Kagami is trying to help him out, somebody comes up from behind him and scares Kagami and he passes out, just like he did in the audio drama, which is actually hilarious. And so when he wakes up, it turns out that it was Alex, like not the golden retriever, but the actual Alex. Apparently, um, she found out from both their parents that their kids were missing and she found a map that Himuro had left in his bedroom and goes off to find them and figures out they came here. So yeah, their parents are very mad with Himuro and Kagami and Alex is like, I'm not going to get on to you because your parents are um, both going to really be pissed when we get back. Because we find out that um, Alex notes that Himuro is 11 and Kagami is just 10. She's like, your parents are going to be really upset with you. You should not have ran off by yourself. And she tells Himuro to stop trying to grow up too fast. Because Himuro is like, well, we're growing up and we don't need our parents to tell us what to do. And you're not our mom and blah, blah, blah. Kind of the same thing he was doing back before the game with, um, right after the game with Yosin or before the game with Yosin versus Seirene. He kind of gives her the same spiel. And Alex is like, look, you shouldn't grow up too fast. Just be yourself, be an 11 year old, be a big brother for Kagami because he needs you. And then she gives him a kiss on the cheek and he blushes and says it's not appropriate for her to do that and that he doesn't want it. And Alex is like, you know, you guys are just, you're 10 years old and 11 year old. She says, Himuro is gentle and Taiga is pure, which I think is a really good summation of their characters, right? And she wonders how long they'll stay like this, but is happy for the time being they're both good friends and she drives them back to their houses. So it's a really long chapter. There's a lot going on in it. And I, I was kind of floored the entire time because I was like, I was just floored the entire time because I'm thinking these are, you know, 10 and 11 year olds going off on their own without their parents. 
something really bad could have happened. But luckily, luckily that's not the case. So uh, chapter four is the chapter that is not translated in the light novel, but it is chapter 34 and 35 of the replaced manga that I went and looked at. And it's basically about the Seirene boys want to find out who Suchita's girlfriend is because he's the only one on the team that doesn't have a, that has a girlfriend. The rest don't. And so they all, after school one day, their practice gets canceled. So they decide to follow Suchita to see who his girlfriend is. And they loop in Kagami and Kuroko neither of whom want to go on this trip. Kagami's like, I want to go home, but Hugo won't let him. And so apparently Suchita was about to go on a date and the others want to find out about it, um, except Kagami and Kuroko. Neither of them are interested at all. The others say it's only because Kuroko is dated with Moi, that's why he's not interested. And Kuroko immediately denies it. Like he literally says in the story, he's like, I have never dated with Moi. I'm just not interested. And Kagami, who is not interested in women in general, is like, I don't know why we're doing this. This is dumb. So they are convinced to follow the Seirin group. Hugo won't let them leave. And Suchita runs into like a series of girls that they debate on whether or not is his girlfriend. The first girl he runs into is apparently Miss Seirin, like the school like class rep and like the pageant princess of Seirin. And he gives her some notebooks and I'm guessing the notebooks were for her to borrow from him to study, but Seirene believes that she dumps him. They think that, that she just met up with him to dump him and that he was sad, which is not the case at all. So the next woman that he runs into is an older woman in her 20s, which gets them all riled up being like, oh my God, is Suchita dating an older woman? No, it turns out to be like his study tutor for English that he meets up with after school every day. Like the third girl he meets, um, though is the one that gets them all shocked and that is um, the Tobe sister <laughs> So they end up meeting the the one girl that's Miss Seirene. They figure out that Suchita is just giving her notes to study um, The second woman that they meet is in her 20s. And they figure out that she's just a tutor for him The third girl he meets is Matobe's younger sister and Matobe freaks out Thinking that Suchita is seeing and dating his younger sister like Matobe is having like a freak out existential moment and they, at that point, Kogani's like, we need to find out if Suchita is dating the sister because Matobe is freaking out. So they confront, they confront uh, Suchita about it. And well, they confront Matobe's sister after Suchita leaves. And they're like, are you dating someone? And she's like, yeah, I'm dating someone. And Matobe freaks out even more. And that's when Matobe's sister's like, oh, not Suchita, we're just friends. And so while they're all relieved, that it's not Suchita dating Matobe's sister. Matobe is still freaked out because he didn't even know his sister was dating anybody. So it's really funny. But they end up like leaving Matobe's sister. They follow Suchita and they see him sitting next to an elderly lady and they're like, what is going on? And finally they just give up. At that point they're like, there's no way that Suchita is dating an older woman. We just need to leave. So the next day they find out from Tepe that Suchita's girlfriend is just somebody that's in class with him. He's like, oh, I met Suchita's girlfriend. They're like, what? He's like, yeah, she's in class with me. And so of course they ask, what type of girl is she? Like, we've met an older woman. We've met Matobe's sister. We met this elderly woman. We've met this little kid. Like, like what's going on? And Tepe's like, well, she's ordinary. And the team is relieved. They're like, oh, okay. Suchita's just dating an ordinary girl. Awesome. It's the weirdest chapter, but the thing with Matobe, it's worth looking at chapters 35 and 34 of the manga. Seeing Matobe freak out about his sister dating Suchita is worth every moment. It was hilarious. So chapter five is Murasaki Bara's disaster arc. It's, I don't know why it's called that. It's kind of weird, but it mainly focuses on Murasaki Bara walking home from school on a day in October where apparently wherever he lives at in Japan, it snows early. And so the day he's walking home from school, it starts snowing in October. But Murasaki Bara, he's kind of like chill with it. One thing I like about Murasaki Bara in all of these extra chapters is he's very chill. He's just kind of like, okay with everything. He's like, nah, it's fine, man. And he just goes with the flow, right? And so he seems totally fine with it. And he starts like trying to catch snowflakes like on his tongue. And Tamuro's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm catching snowflakes. And he tries to get Hamuro to join him, which is the cutest thing. But Hamuro is like, no, I'm too good to catch snowflakes on my tongue. And Murasaki is like, okay. So they meet up with their teammates who are all teasing one another. Yosin's team is like a hot mess. 
I I thought, you know, Kaijo seems like they're all put together. I mean, they have girl troubles, and Shitoku just seems like they're kind of just dysfunctional in their own way. Yosin is majorly dysfunctional they just banter and tease one another it's crazy fukui one of the teammates says that they all have to sculpt snow sculptures for their class that it's part of their grade and murray sakibara cannot understand why they have to do this as an assignment one thing that they note in this light novel is that murray sakibara he seems less apt to do something if it's for a cause rather than just for fun if it's just for fun he's all about it but if there's a purpose behind it he's like mm, i don't know so he tries to get out of it, but the others convince him that he needs to do it for the team. And so they go to Ryokuchi Park to make the sculptures. And Okamura and Fukui reminisce about their previous days making sculptures in previous years in the same class that they're all in. And so when they arrive at the park, there are a ton of kindergartners there. Apparently the kindergartners are all um, just there on a school trip they end up kind of becoming friends with the members of Yosin. And by becoming friends, I mean they torment them. <laughs> um, the girls try to get Himuro to play with them and like play house and stuff because they think Himuro is really cute. And yet somehow he gets them occupied and says he's gonna go find uh, Murasaki Bar instead. He's like, oh, I'd love to play with you little girls, but I gotta go find my friend. And he leaves them with the other boys on Yosin's team. So we cut to Murisaki Bara, who's on a bench, and he's bored because he can't build a snowman by himself. And this boy comes up to the park bench and, like, seems like he's scared of Murisaki Bara, and he backs up into this tree. And Murisaki Bara, like, luckily, like, when he backs up into the tree, all the snow falls on the little kid, but Murisaki Bara, like, lifts his hand in the snow and, like, plucks the kid out like a radish. <laughs> he just pops the kid out of the snow. And he asks the boy what the problem is. And the boy says he's freaked out by Murasaki Bara. And so while Murasaki Bara is kind of stunned by this, he's like, why is this kid freaked out by me? We cut back to Okamura and the others who are all working with their kids, then back to Murasaki Bara. And he's trying his best to cheer up the kid, but he's struggling because Murasaki Bara is not good at cheering people up. And it doesn't seem to work at first, but then Murasaki Bara like starts telling him some jokes and the kid starts lightening up. And he tells Murasaki Bara that he's lamenting that the reason why he was so scared and the reason why he's so sad is because he's not tall. And that he laments the fact that Murasaki Bara is able to do so much because he's tall, like not covered up by snow, like being able to play games, things like that. And so about this time, Hamuro shows up, of course, and he acknowledges to the kid that he's like, you know, being tall isn't everything. He's like, Kimuro gets um, Murray Sakibara to lament over the struggles of being tall. And Murray Sakibara says, and I'm going to quote the book here, he says, yeah, my feet stick out of the bed and I can't find clothes in my size. And if you're tall when you ride the train, the hand straps and the advertisements are always in the ray. If you bang your head on them, it hurts quite a lot. He's like, and I also wish that people would stop using me as a meeting place. As he remembered the countless times in middle school that they'd been told, oh, meet in front of the main gate under Murray Sakibara. And Murray Sakibara puffed out his cheeks in discontent. Which is really cute. And I feel I felt really bad for Murray Sakibara at that moment. I was like, oh, like I could see him being really upset that they were just using him as a place to gather under. I was like, that's so sad. They weren't treating him as a person. And so the boy says that he has to get tall for a specific reason. And that's when Himuro asks, well, why do you have to get tall? And it says, in response to Himuro's question, the boy hung his head and said, I, I have a little brother, but he's taller than me and faster than me. I'm his big brother, but I'm so short and I don't stand out. I'm so lame. And then Himuro's like, so you're a big brother. And there was a hint, a hint of loneliness in Himuro's smile as he gently caressed the boy's head. Because Himuro instantly realizes, wow, you mean you have a younger brother who's bigger and taller than you and makes you have a um, sense of unfulfillment <laughs> and discontent? <laughs> Which is basically Kagami and Himuro. So instead, Himuro's like, well, okay, well, if you can't be tall, you know, being tall isn't everything. Not everybody's going to get taller. They can't decide that for themselves. He's like, but instead, why don't you become better at a game than your little brother? He's like, why don't you become better at, like, hide and seek or something? and beat your brother at that game. And that's something your brother can't control you beating him over. And it says, quote, while he kept a watchful eye on the boy walking innocently in front of him, after the boy decides that that's a great idea, Hamuro says, it's unusual for you to be so gentle with somebody, Murisaki Bara. 
Nope, nah, uh I wasn't being gentle. He gave me candy, so I gave him advice. That's all. You don't have to be embarrassed about it. I'm not embarrassed. Hamuro chuckled when Murasaki Bara grew defensive, and he didn't press any further. So yeah, showing that Murasaki Bara was being nice to the kid, he just didn't want to admit it. So the group ends up lamenting that they didn't get to make the ice sculptures and the igloos that they wanted. Apparently they started making them, but because all the kindergartners were around, they started to fall apart or get wrecked or whatever. And they managed to convince their coach, though, that they could go back some other time and remake them for class, which is cute. And so at the end of the year at the Winter Cup, um, it's told in the light novel that Yosin gets volunteered to help out with the kindergartners at their end of school party. And Murasaki Bara gets nominated to play the monster at the party, which is, you know, because he's big and tall and it's really cute. So, yeah, it was a really sweet chapter. I, I loved the fact that we get to see Murasaki Bara be kind of softer. It was really cool. And then seeing Himuro and him, like, bounce off each other in dialogue and the themes of the story. The, the chapter was really cute. I liked it a lot. I thought it was, I thought it was a lot of fun. But the last chapter of light novel number three is called Dai Chan's Awakening this chapter. So basically, while Momoi was surrounded in the forest shrine, again, they're all back in middle school, right? So while Momoi, back in chapter one, was being surrounded by the guys hitting on her at the forest shrine and Murasaki Bara and Midorma and them were all gone, um, Almine was waiting to, for her to come back with his food and he ends up winning a raffle there at the rest area and the raffle prize is a Horikita Mai photo book. And apparently Kisei is the one that gave him the ticket for the raffle and that's the one he won. So I'm like, Kisei's good luck. Just canon good luck, Kisei. So Amine wins the photo book of Horikita Mai, which we've seen him have in high school, right? And as he's walking away with the raffle prize, the actual Horikita Mai shows up. Like she shows up in all of her glory. Apparently she was having like a press event there to support the photo book. Shows up. The story makes well to note that as Momoi has G cups, Horikita has H cups. And Almine is stunned by her. And she thanks him saying in the novel, and I quote, Where'd you get that? I won it in a raffle. Wow, so many of my photo books are being used as prizes. That's amazing. And then Almine thinks, what's amazing is your boobs. <laughs> and so it says, and I'm quoting the novel saying, in an attempt to burn the sight of those soft mounds into his memory, Almine stopped blinking. So Almine has a sexual awakening right there and then, of course. And she says that she was just stopping by and taking turns to like see her photo book and sign it. And then using the hand holding the photo book, she accidentally trips and Almine catches her. But when he catches her, um, there's an image. When he catches her, his like arm like goes up against her boob and it touches her breast on accident. And Almine basically has a sexual awakening as Horikita thanks him for saving her and leaves. But in the last chapter, Almine decides to keep it a secret from everyone. But he remembers that moment from ever on, forever on and it explains why he's obsessed with her in high school. So yeah, so it all makes sense now why Almine, if we're going by the timeline, Almine doesn't have a sexual awakening until this moment. So this whole time Momoi has been like, he's been like standoffish against Momoi. He's not acknowledged that she's somebody he could be attracted to. And then he has a sexual awakening with Horikita Mai and then suddenly he's like, hmm, hmm. I, it's, it's such a great chapter. It's hilarious. But I'm like, okay explaining why, why Almine likes Horikita Mai so much and why he loves boobs. Understandable. But yeah, I these five chapters in the bonus chapter, they were all really, really good. I, I like, this is probably my favorite light novel as a whole so far. Um, I obviously, the, the Kagami, the chapters with Hamuro in them are really long and they weren't my favorites, but I really enjoyed them. They were a lot of fun to read. The Rico and Hugo chapter, I was fangirling so hard reading it. I had to like stop and just like do this, being like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, like the whole time reading it. And then the festival chapters, like Dai <laughs> Daichi's Awakening, and then the summer festival, the Taiko middle school chapters, they were all just really good too. And then of course the Suchita one was just ridiculous. But they were a lot of fun. Um, I highly suggest if you get a chance to go on the Internet Archive, look up these novels. They are great. I hope you get a chance to read them. 
because they were a lot of fun. But if you go in the Discord too, um, in the pins, there are, um, it's pinned in there, the light novels, so you can read them as well. But I highly recommend them. The third light novel is really good. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I'm really excited. I want to, I finished it last night before I recorded this video, and I already want to dive into the fourth light novel to see what's going to happen next. So we'll see, right? But anyway, I, I'm excited. I hope you all enjoyed this review, uh, this plot summary book report of the light novel number three. But I will be back next week with the fourth light novel to talk about it. So in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and yes, I'll be back very soon to talk about more Kuroko's basketball. Bye!